Okay, students, so let's have a little quick slideshow on the aspects of monochromatic painting. Basically, we're doing a value painting, but we're just limiting it to the black and white tubes of paint that you have in your kit and keeping everything in just, you know, just in the terms of light and dark, light and shadow, and all the gradations of value in between. Really, this is one of the most important types of painting there is because it's value is more important than color. Color is awesome. Color is the icing on the cake. And yes, it does do a lot. And of course, you know, why else would you paint if you didn't care about color? But you always have to think about value, always. So it's really the first thing that we need to, to, to focus on. That and, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to paint in a way that we don't have to worry about mixing color so much at first. You can get your hands dirty, just use a couple of tubes of paint and start making different grays with the tubes of black and white that you have. This painting is done by Mark Tanzi, and I just like it because of its sort of ironic, uh, you know, easel painters, they're painting a rocket launch. You know, easel painting takes a long time, and here they're doing something that, you know, only takes a few seconds. So it's a bit humorous. So let's talk about that demo about staining. So I showed you how to stain a painting and how to lay a color down so you're not just, you know, dazzled by a brilliant white. And there's a lot of different colors that people will lay down to sort of inform the, 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 the subsequent layers of paint that they add on top. And this one is done in burnt sienna. Now, but this one includes what's referred to as an underpainting. So kind of in that early stage of staining, they're also painting with just that same color, but it's putting it on like ink washes and thicker and thicker layers to give themselves an idea of what the values are going to be and what the composition is going to look like. It's a great way to get a lot of your information sorted out. And it's very similar like to what we're doing now with the monochromatic painting, just everything done in the same color. So inversions of burnt sienna, a nice earthy reddish brown. This one was stained first in raw sienna, and then once that paint dried, then the artist went over with a white charcoal pencil, did some of their drawing. White, white charcoal pencil is very easy to cover up, especially if you're going to go into the grisaille technique, where you paint in layers of white. So essentially you're just using white, and you build it up just like light is built up. So you create the values, and everywhere that is shadow is just basically, you know, the raw umber that's coming through from underneath. Now in this one though, both the colors are cool. So it gives a sort of asymmetrical um, color, color balance. But here, the underpainting is more of a warm red. Again, burnt sienna probably laid on a little bit thicker, so you have that warmish red. Then the artist drew with a black charcoal pencil. You can see that by evidence of these little black marks here that sort of outline the form. And then they used the same grisaille technique where they added white over the top, just layering it on in different uh, amounts. But the nice thing about this is that with a cool light source, the white being a cool light, all the shadows that are left behind, like down here, all those have that warm element to them, which is more like what it is in real life. In real light, when you have a cool light source, you have usually have warm shadows. Just like if you have a warm light source, you typically have cool shadows. And so this is a great way of even taking that step a little bit further and kind of like already getting to the later stages of the painting in just a very, very short amount of time. So this is a very basic step-by-step -step guide, and we'll just look at it quickly just to get an idea of what we're going to be working with. Of course, you're going to be painting things that are more interesting than a cylinder and a cone and a sphere, but for the most part, this will walk us through the steps. So first, they have a stained background, in this case, a slightly greenish gray. They've done a preliminary drawing. They just use their paintbrush, which is totally fine. You can do that as well, or you can use a pencil. Um, they start adding in the layers of the brightest whites. They go to the other side of the spectrum, add in the layers of the darkest darks. Then they start mixing and mix some on their palette, some versions of gray. So they have a darker gray and lighter grays. 
and that's just you know simply by adding more white or adding more black and you can get different variations of gray and putting those in their respective spots and because this is an alla prima painting in other words it's done probably really quickly the paint is most likely still wet and so they're able to go in then with a brush that's a little bit you know kind of dry brush it together and scumble those edges and feather them up and make more realistic sort of gradations of how those values would look sort of molding and working them a little more and for the background they do something similar um, it's kind of a cheesy background to be honest they're they're not really doing much of uh, an indication of the background space other than that it's just a gradation from light to dark but you can see how they set that up just in various layers and then sort of scumbled it together. Okay, so now this is one of my previous, I'm sorry, it's not the greatest slide. Um, I'll get my face out of here. It's, it's, um, it's, you know, not the greatest slide, but it gives you a really good idea of using that technique of using white, using black and mixing all the grays from in between. Let's see. So this is the kind of grays they made. They have a little bit of a variation in the background. There's some parts that get darker. But what they're really paying attention to are the lights and shadows in the, in the bottle. Just like you would in a, a value drawing, they're paying very close attention to the very subtle changes from dark to light to this reflected light down here. Over here in this you know, pewter uh, candlestick holder, all the different ways that light reflects in that metal piece kind of the abrupt changes from light to dark. Here on this darker ceramic vessel, you have this bright highlight, this nice curved shadow, this cool reflected light down here that's actually the tabletop being reflected up into the base of that, of that creamer vessel. And this tiny little bit of highlight right here in the corner. All things that really make this you know, interesting to look at and, and fun to observe all the different light sources. And then of course also to the, the cast the cast shadows that go across the table themselves. Here's another one um, done the same way, again using using a mixed colors, black and white, just the sculpt of different shapes. Really good observation of all the different highlights versus the medium grays versus the darker grays versus the really dark grays, etc. A really good example of, of how that happens and the texture of these bowling balls really is just comes from a really close observation of seeing that thing in real life looking at it closely and noticing how light plays across the surface and if you just do your best to try to recreate those values as you see them you're going to get a surface that feels just the same now this one's slightly different rather than mixing their tones they sort of applied paint in a very thin washy manner almost like they would with an ink wash or with watercolor and as as they built the layers up those layers got darker so rather than staining their canvas they started with a white they drew their objects in a black charcoal pencil and then they just built up those layers to create the darks it is a sort of effective way of doing it However, it does look a little bit more like an underpainting. It doesn't feel as established as the other paintings I've shown you. So I'm not necessarily sure this is the best way of going about it, but it is a good way of maybe starting. There's, there's more than one way of doing any kind of painting, and it's really hard to teach sometimes because of that fact. There, there's a lot of ways of going about this. Here's one that kind of uses both. There's sort of the washy stains in the background um, but then they build up more opaque values on top. But just look at all the different things going on. Here the brush strokes are kind of expressive. You sort of see them. They're not as blended as the other ones, but it adds a lot of uh, movement to the painting. Here's one that's very still. Part of the reason is uh, the lines are quite static. They're all parallel to the edges of the form or edges of the canvas. You know, these are all vertical. These lines are all horizontal. It makes for a very almost surrealistically still image. But again, you know, just notice all the light and shadows. Here's 
There's one that uses a little bit of both. There's some washy bits over here, but then there's some mixed grays over here, which I think actually makes a nice contrast. You really get a sense of the feeling of the difference of the surface of this bowling ball versus the surface of the background here. It feels different, even though they're both versions of gray. This one just has that, I don't know, has a smoothness to it that a bowling ball would have. Another version. This painting actually was done by Jesse Crumb. I don't know, unfortunately he died uh, around here recently, but he was the son of one of the famous artists, um, Robert Crumb. So here's one of his pieces. Really good versions of how that light is reflected in the vinyl of that carrying case. Really get a sense of how the folds feel and that reflective kind of vinyl surface. Looks really good. Here, kind of the reflected light, light bouncing off the table and under lighting down here in that dark area down here. Another beautiful piece. Um, really happy with this composition, the way they got both balls in there. They're just both sort of going off the page, the way this angle sort of goes up at a dynamic slope really adds a lot more movement to the piece. Some of the brush strokes are, are visible. Um, and these cast shadows really feel like the right tone. A lot of times people make their cast shadows too dark, but here you have a very well lit room. These shadows like um, being cast on the table, they would, they would appear this light. And you can even see, sorry, um, right here where there's a double cast shadow. You can tell there was even another light source in the room that was sort of affecting and casting another shadow. So you get a lighter part and then a darker part here. Same over here, you get a, this little, little cut, lighter shadow, slightly darker shadow here. All really good observations of what the light and dark is doing. I can't emphasize that enough. A lot of what makes painting good is the value. That is a number one, what you want to be looking for when you're working is the different values. Color is a sweet bonus, but if you can't sort of take that color painting and, and imagine it in, in a balance of light and dark, it's gonna fall short somehow. So you really wanna make sure you look at that. Here's one that's uh, it's a nice piece. Uh, they've added a little bit of color, so they kinda, you know, were rebellious and it went beyond the monochromatic scheme. It's mostly a monochromatic painting, but they were just so seduced by this sort of copper slice at the bottom of this metallic pot, coffee pot, that then they ended up putting it in and therefore trying to find other places where that color was sort of reflected either from the room or from whatever uh, from this color bouncing off of other objects kind of finding its way there maybe finding its way here there's even a hint of blue up here in the blacks but that's just kind of enhanced the painting a little bit adding a little bit of the the blue and orange colors the only thing i find wrong with this is i find this ellipse a little bit too wide in comparison to the really flat ellipse at the bottom this just shows a little bit of a sloppiness in their, their buildup of drawing this ellipse should be rounder and this one should be less round up here otherwise gorgeous painting and really that metallic surface a lot of times people ask how do you paint a metallic surface how do you make that work you really just have to see how things are reflected and finally um this piece here let me get my face out of here um just another great example of a monochromatic painting a really cool composition that sort of leads you in, it's got this, you know, sort of gnarly dough hook and the metallic bowl in the background and all the different values and shades that are happening here and how it's kind of an open composition by the way that, you know, this goes off the page or off the, off the canvas there and it goes off the canvas here, it sort of draws you in, it feels like maybe there's more going on to the scene than it actually seems. All right, so you get the idea. Um, this is a great, again, a great opportunity for you to practice mixing paint um, without worrying about color. We're just going to use black and white and 
um, use that to paint whatever sort of still life that you set up. Keep it a little simple and good luck.